Gardens. These are guys who uh, come from the same city. They know each other. They've played at local fireside gatherings. The two beers came through kind of the same way as as Six Oak and guys like Faramir coming through Meltdown in Berlin and uh, playing at those local events. And then he's here in the final, beating Strife Crow, beating Eloise on the way here, being guys like Super JJ as well. It's uh, We said that two beers hadn't had the most impressive run to the final in the group stages sure. but yeah, yeah. now he's made it to the playoffs it's uh it's certainly been an impressive run yeah there's no debating it now uh we, we we had a conversation yesterday where it's like you know he's beaten some really really strong players let's take nothing away from super jj and the other people that he beat but strive crow was definitely a set a step up in terms of you know really really established tournament winning professional hearthstone players um so yeah, for him to go through that and then follow it up with a big win over Eloise as well, like he's he's certainly upped his game to to go along with the incre uh, increased quality of competition, and he definitely deserves to be here in the final. His his um he's brought a strategy to this to this tournament. You know, he's he's put tech cards in his deck. He's targeted specific things, and um, with the Dreadscale Double Hunters Mark Hunter deck that also has a Harrison Jones squeezed in there as well, and that deck's done a lot of work for him. So. Yeah, we'll talk about the lineups in just a second, but let's talk about Sixel real quick as well. Obviously, we talked about how he was maybe on a dip of form on his the at the back end of his career with Archon, left that team, is now signed to with Navi, but even in the point before he was signing with Navi, was uh, really looking impressive, had really turned on his form, won the uh, Esports Arena tournament, his first major event, his first LAN event win, which is a great one to get under your belt, really, to, to get a first real big live event win. Uh, to really establish yourself among the, the very top tier of Hearthstone. And now he's winning a lot of online invitationals as well, doing very well in online cups. He has always been uh, a real online cup warrior. It was uh, yeah. one of the stereotypical online qualifier you know, warriors that played in basically everything that he could online. Right. For a while, there was there was kind of a meme where like open qualifiers had to introduce the 6-0 rule, which is, you know, 6-0 has to be invited to your tournament. Otherwise, no one else has a chance to qualify because he's just going to win the open qualifier. That was definitely a thing for a while. But 6-0 raised his profile. He did start getting those invites and gave a, a few other a few of us uh, mere mortals a chance to have a stab at open qualification spots instead. Um, but yeah, 6 definitely now a huge name, very, very worthy of invites to big tournaments of himself. You know, obviously, he got invited to this tournament and he has justified that invitation um, to the fullest. He's here in the final. Um, it's going to be a, a fantastic set against two beers, I'm sure. Yeah, it's going to be a best of seven in our final. We've been best of oh. fives all the way through. It's going to be a best of seven, uh, but we are still going to see a ban. So we've talked about how last year's standing encourages tactical picking. So they are still going to get to ban. And then at any point throughout the series, they can revive a deck. Oh, at lost. any point. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're, we're making it as tactical as possible for these guys. They really have an opportunity to manipulate their lineups to really try and match their decks up against their opponents as well as possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I really like this. I think it really shows off the, the flexibility of last year's standing potentially. Watch as 6 now just 4 rows with Face Hunter. Uh, but uh, yeah. the flexibility of last year's standing. Of course, this is a last year's standing tournament if you're just joining us, as opposed to Conquest. But uh, it's going to be a great final. What kind of impact does the the banning and the reviving have in the lineups for maybe people who are just joining us. So just to be clear before I get started, you are in charge. You get to pick to one of your own decks to revive at any sure. point. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're yeah. not picking a revive for your opponent. No, you're picking you, a revive you can yourself. revive one of your locked out decks. All right. Um, so the, the opportunity to be able to do it at any time is, uh, again, very, very interesting. Um, it's something that's um, often given to a as a, a winner's bracket advantage to in a double elimination format to the player that's... Um, gone through as it gone through in the winner's bracket is they are allowed to choose a revival for their opponent or that you know they have to only win three games their opponent has to win four can choose a revival of their own etc um but um taking away sort of the advantageous element of that and just leaving it kind of level for both sides just introduces another layer um where you you know you can ban out a deck that you're scared of your opponent being able to play twice um you can try and really um line up one deck that you think has favorable matchups, ban out the bad matchup for that, and then you're almost just relying on that deck to carry you because of the fact that you can play it twice. You know, play it, do as well as you can with it, get the loss, and then just revive it and play it again. If you feel like that one deck has consistent enough matchups across the board and you're able to sneak it through the ban phase, you can kind of just lean on that one deck. Um, so there's a lot of different elements you can enter into here, and it does, as you say, just introduce another level of uh, strategy to the pick and ban phase. And, I mean, we've talked about uh, the Hunter deck from Two Beers uh, quite strongly all the way through. And, you know, it's been a deck that he's leaned on heavily. It's very teched out. Is that a deck that is six or you just uh, you just look to ban straight away? 
Yeah, I mean, it's debatable, but, you know, Two Beers does have the pally as well, so he may gain an advantage from the fact that he's managed to build up a bit of fear in that Hunter deck, he has been successful for, and it is obviously uh, so well teched out against some of the matchups that you know, he's coming up against in the tournament, where if he can kind of uh, intimidate his opponent into banning that deck out, he then gets to use his pally and try and run right with that. Um, so it's kind of a catch-22 situation from 6 uh, where he can only choose to ban one of those two classes. Well, I can tell you that Sixo has not decided to ban either the Paladin or the Hunter. He's gone for the Druid. Interesting. And uh, Two Beers has banned the Freeze Mage of Sixo. So we're just getting into the game here. Game number one is going to be the Druid for Sixo against the Paladin of Two Beers to start with. And you can see the Harrison in his Paladin as well. Yeah, this Paladin has a Defender of Argus in it. Uh, was... So Two Beers must have been one of the players that was playing mid-range Paladin previously, yeah, and I... not the Secrets Paladin, is that right? Yeah, it's the same kind of deck we saw from uh, Nyria. Yeah, so it lo looks very much like that. Yeah, IMB Cow, another card that's slightly more common in, in the mid-range deck, although it started to make its way into the Secrets deck as well. Um, but strong start from Sixo's side here, and just Hero Power Pass from, uh, from Two Beers. Uh, looks like we're going to coin... Uh, Sixo is coining and then pausing, which does reveal the fact that he has multiple options with four mana in his hand. Um, this is something we've seen for Sixo throughout this tournament, and honestly, just Sixo in general. Like he's a he's a fast, instinctive player a lot of the time. Um, he has been playing a ton of Patron for the last couple of months, which isn't a deck you can play quickly. But generally, when he when he goes back to his aggro roots, he is quite a quick, instinctive player. Uh, we've seen him slam some cards off the top of his deck so quickly that they bugged out the Spectator client today. Um, and yeah, he was very, very quick to commit the coin there and then stop to think about which of the four drops he actually wanted to play. Yeah, as you say, that does give information to his opponent that there were multiple options available there. Uh, what do you think of the combatant over the Shredder? Uh, I mean, I, I like it. There's no coin available from your opponent, so the chance there's no chance of this combatant getting taken down for uh, by uh, True Silver. And it's just a much more aggressive minion than Piloted Shredder. You know, it represents the five damage on the board instead of just the four from the Shredder. And it also gives you the extra damage from your hero power. Allows you to be flexible the next turn and either go with the Shredder, as we see Sixo do here. Or he also has the option to hero power down a decent sized minion, like an outdoor Peacekeeper. And then play uh, Druid and Saber to follow up with the rest of the mana. Um, so the, the Savage Combatant development certainly gave him a lot of options that turn. But True Silver is a... Decent looking pickup here from Two Beers to try and stem the flood of some of this damage for right now. Yeah, definitely. You can take out this Savage Combatant, which right. is going to start to do a lot of work, but you're already going to be putting yourself towards half health here on turn four, and there is a Fell Reaver to come down on turn five. Yeah, he's instead going to go look for the Consecration here, which uh, takes one more minion off the board. He's going to be left just with the Shredder Drop. Uh, does get rid of the Mana Crystal, ruins the opportunity for the Fell Reaver follow up. But uh, Sixo does still have a little bit of gas going here, develops the uh, Druid and Saber in stealth, pokes one more to the face with the Ooze and one more with the Hero Power, and 15, he's halfway done with his job, and his job is reduce that number to zero. Double Truce over coming to hand, not great couple of draws there. But do you think we just see the Harrison Jones come down here as a five drop just to threaten the board? Yeah, I like it. Um, seems like a minion that will certainly get ignored. Doesn't seem to have too much value of being traded into. And then you can follow it up next mm. turn with uh, another minion plus taunt or hero power plus taunt, depending on how you go with it, using the Defender of Argus. I uh, don't think there's too much merit to a, spending your whole turn equipping a True Silver and, and sniping down a uh, Echoing one. Ooze just to take that one damage off the board. So I feel like the development play is pretty strong. Uh, he's actually going to peck away at the Echoing Ooze, which does deal one more damage to himself, which is... Pretty relevant at this point when you've lost uh, over, well, you've lost exactly half your health before he made the attack by turn five. Yeah, the taunt's going to come down more than likely this turn because there's no way to deal with this unless BGH comes out. Okay, yeah, it does pick up Coghammer. Yeah, with this being the more mid rangey deck, there is the possibility of Outdoor Ke Out Peacekeeper, which is, of course, the absolute dream against Fell Reverse. He didn't necessarily need the big game hunter, he did have a few outs. And uh, Coghammer is one of them that, from Two Beers' perspective at least, is a pretty decent stalling Let technique here. But I think he's going to favor the uh, the Defender of Argus play here to create the, the two taunts instead of one. Yeah, and if he wants to, he can trade away both of the other minions and leave just the Fell Reaver on board. Yep. It does mean that the Harrison dies to, uh, can die to swipe in hero power. You can clear everything with swipe in hero power of the taunts. Yep. 
So this is uh, unfortunately just going to be no dice here for uh, two beers. Swipe is just perfect here. Four to the zombie chow, one to the Harrison Jones, one to the face. Hero power lets him push through, and then the Fel Reaver gets in for that eight that it always hungers to. Eight damage to the face, seals out the game. Another extremely quick aggro victory for the six of them. Yeah, I mean, this is what he wants to do with these aggro decks. We have seen his one really control deck uh, banned out in the Freeze Mage. So this is going to be almost full Smork 6-0 in this, uh, in this series. He's got the the mid-range Patron Warrior as well, which yeah. would be nice to get to see some more. But, uh, I mean, if 6-0 just wants to win with these face decks, I'm not going to complain. Yeah, I mean, 6-0 definitely, before he became really, really, really well known because of his insane success on ladder and in tournaments with, with Patron Warrior, he was primarily known as an aggro player. Um, perhaps biased a little bit by uh, he really got a lot of fame early on because of his ladder marathons, you know, the race to first legend early in the season. Sure. And of course, and when hitting he was, like three oh, across all three accounts and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Of course, when he was doing that, he was using quick decks and quick decks obviously mean aggro. So he is a versatile player. He can play a lot more than just aggro, but certainly aggro is something he's extremely comfortable with and that probably has to go down as one of the best aggro players in the world for sure. Yeah, so it's going to be that mid-range hunter for two beers into the aggro druid. I'm not sure what it does up against it. I mean... It can get the early threat and try and control the board and stop things coming down, but the Hunter's Mark, of course, a great answer to a Fell Reaver, and I definitely don't mind keeping the Hunter's Mark in the opening hand. Yeah, I think especially with, with how this deck is teched out with extra things like the Dread Scale, that Hunter's Mark is really, really flexible in this deck. It can combine with the Knife Juggler that we see in his hand already. It can combine with um, Unleash the Hounds. Uh, it's obviously excellent already with Web Spinner, which he also already has. And then, uh, yeah, just the Dread Scale added on top of that means that um, Hunter's Mark is a, is a lot more of a flexible card in this deck than it is in most builds of Midrange Hunter. There's a Core Hound coming out for uh, two years. <laughs> Yeah. Don't know if that's going to see much play. Doesn't look like it, no. Um, so the Unleash the Hounds comes into the hand, which might make him a little bit hesitant to uh, lose this Knife Juggler here, but he has to find some way of dealing with that uh, Darnassus Aspirant before the uh, the mana situation gets too far out of control for 6 mm -hmm. Um Looks like he's just going to value using the Coin Kill command and keep that Knife Juggler Unleash play for a, for a, later, for a further turn. Uh, or at least uh, keep that option available to himself. You know, delay the inevitable perhaps of having to play the Knife Juggler, but at least keep the option available if he can pick up some, some other things to do. Very quick turn from 6 where where he just uh, hit the, played the uh, Aspirant and hit face. Yep. Uh, not much of a else for, to do for 6-0 that turn and I said he'd be looking to pick up some other options so he doesn't have to commit that knife juggler and that unfortunately is an option that he already had so that doesn't give him too much more versatility here and he's going to have to think long and hard about whether he really wants to continue to hang on to the value of this juggler unleash combo which is one of the best uh, answers to aggro in, in midrange hunter yeah I, th I think he's going to have to throw the knife juggler right here drawing the second unleash is such a whiff at this point yeah I'm not sure there are many more cards that you would be less pleased to see. Yeah, I mean, it's not the end of the world. Knife Juggler does kind of have Taunt. You do have to deal with it. You can't leave it around on the board because it represents so much value as a clearing tool against aggro as well as just a threat itself. Um, so I like the Savage Roar here. It pushes through a lot of damage with two minions on the board and just gets a... Uh, uses the hero damage to take out the Knife Juggler and keeps his position on the board nice and secure. I like it especially when you've just top decked the Force of Nature because that means you're keeping more sources of direct damage in your hand. He's, he had two sources of direct damage in his hand. He swapped one out as he top decked another one. Sure. Um, so the Unleash the Hounds kill command, uh, Unleash the Hounds uh, Hunter's Mark here, sorry, is uh, is going to leave 6 0 out of options in his hand because of the mana loss. But there we go. You saw it again. The spectator bug for a little second there just because of how quickly 6 0 slammed that card off the top of his deck. And Freezing Trap coming down from two years to try and isolate this piloted Shredder. We've seen that a couple of times. Uh, Pilot Shredder is such a high value target for Freezing Trap. It's just not going to hold though. Force of Nature, perfect answer to Freezing Trap. He's going to get to push through four damage to two tree ants that do get to connect and hold that third tree ant back in his hand as additional damage later and push through the damage of the Pilot Shredder that was isolated against the Freezing Trap. Um, one of the really, really favorable interactions that even mid-range Druid does have against mid-range Hunter, even though that's kind of a poor matchup, is that Force of Nature Freezing Trap interaction. So this uh, more aggressive Druid has access to that as well, on top of so many other things that make it a better matchup. 
And no real good answer in the hand for the Hunter. Mad Scientist can come down with a hero power, start chipping away, but we can't afford to take out this Pilot Shredder with the bolt. You might, you, you might die. Yep, and <laughs> Dr. Boom is just going to come down, unless Sixo is just going to pause for a second. Wait, do I have lethal? No, I don't. All right, let's play Boom. Uh, with Swipe and Treant, he could have added six more to the four he had already, but ten's not enough. So just going to develop the big boy, get the 7-7 seven, seven in play. Boom bots potentially uh, get some burst damage as well if, he, if they direct themselves at face. Um, we do see the second Hunter's Mark, though, along with the second Unleash the Hounds. So... Potential for a, a little bit of a comeback mounting ever so slowly for two beers. Not completely out of this yet, but so much damage built up in the in 6-0's hand that I don't think even this is going to be enough. Yeah, Ago Druid looking like such a strong option for 6 here. He's on the cusp of a second win with it. So we're going to see the Hunter's Mark come down, clear out the 7-7. Seven, seven. And then I guess he's just going to try and isolate the Pilot Shredder again, get his information first as to what he has to do this turn. He does, of course, have a Snake Trap in his deck as well, and it looks like he got the Snakes based on the way he's attacking them. And hopes that the dog doesn't get hit. It doesn't, but four to face. That's just going to end the game anyway. Yeah, there yep, we go. Yep, Swipe is going to be perfect, even without a tree on the Hero Barry. And yeah, just I think concede. Two Beers knows that that wasn't going to be a, a good outcome for him. Sixo halfway home with the Echo Jewels. Yeah, not quite as fast as the last four wins we've seen him pick up, I don't think. Uh, that was, I think they were all within about turn seven or so uh, in the previous set and the first game of this set. So he, he technically had lethal on turn eight there. So Sixo slacking a bit, slowing down, not killing people quite as quick anymore. Well, you know, it's been a long day. He's been playing a lot of games of Hearthstone. He's just, you know, he wants to, he wants to face Hunter and chill and uh, really just relax and go about his aggro as he does of an evening. Six are just sitting down, throwing some aggro at the ladder, and uh, that's how he relaxes, really, I think. Pretty much, yeah. And you can just see the difference in reactions on the on the two players' face. Two beers, definitely a bit distraught after that last loss, deep in thought, trying to work out how he's going to dig this way out. And 6-0 with that just 6-0 look on his face, just like, yeah, this is what I do. I wreck scrubs with aggro, deal with it. And losing his hunter, that's got to feel pretty bad for two beers. So this is a revival on the paladin here. Yeah, attempt number two at the Paladin. And uh, Midrange Paladin, um, I think Cursed, who uh, came up with the original idea for this um, this aggro druid deck, that it's pretty much uh, you know less than a month old at this point. It was it was really used at the start of this season when Cursed and Sixo, in fact, were racing for first to legend and um, one of those uh, marathon sessions that we were talking about earlier. I think Cursed actually considers Midrange Paladin to be the worst matchup for the deck. So um, no great surprise to me to see Midrange Paladin being revived here. Yeah, we kept the Eldor Peacekeeper in the opening hand this time after being uh, destroyed by the Fell Reaver in the first game. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we're going to see Sixo go all the way through to innovate Double Darnus as Aspirin here. Yeah, I love it. Um, Paladin has no way to interact with uh, a minion that you play. You know, the first thing that they do that can deal damage from hand is Muster for Battle on turn three, and that only does one. So these um, Aspirants are going to stick to the board almost 100% of the time, or actually just 100% of the time. Yeah. And then you're just going to develop, be able to develop Savage Combatant on the following turn if you want to. So I uh, love the play to invest in the in the, in the uh, double Darnassus there. Yeah, Combatant is a little bit weak to Aldor Peacekeeper coming into turn three, but I still think you play it and then you trade one of the Aspirants into the Knife Juggler, just control the board and do the damage. But 6-0 maybe disagrees. He's going to go for the Living Roots. I th he's going to use them for board rather than damage. Yeah, he's valuing the board here. Um, I definitely just like gonna this. go for savage war okay yeah this is i mean if you're not used to playing this deck it can be a little counterintuitive at first because obviously druids normal mid-range druid loves to uh hoard cards um combo pieces for the big turn nine combo but this deck is so aggressive that you don't need to rely on that turn nine combo you can get lethal so much quicker as six has already been showing us um and you're he actually forces his opponent to use the outdoor peacekeeper preemptively and now a huge target comes out in the savage combatant that he would love to have out on and there's still the fell reavers in the deck that we've talked about how fantastic feeling uh outdooring a, a fell reaver is so it's one Aldor done, there's such a reduced chance of two years being able to have one. So what is that? That's uh, 7, 8, 9, 13 already. So you can put him to 7 on turn 5. 
so much damage. Of course, he turns down the long-term value of the hero power here by playing the Druid of the Claw. Um, so from a face hunter mentality, you, know, you kind of want to squeeze your hero power in every turn. It's the same thing I talked about before with the, the warrior, right? If you don't press the hero power, that damage that turn is gone forever and you'll never get it back. Um, but he's just developing the Druid of the Claw in taunt form there to protect the long-term damage of his Savage Combat, which makes a lot of sense as well. And I think that's, is that that's gonna just be it? Game. Yeah, that's just it. That's just game. The this is just the most insane streak of aggro wins I think I've ever seen. Wow. Yeah, I've never seen anything like that. It's, it has, it's been something like turn six, turn seven, turn six, turn seven, turn six. Like something like that in terms of wins. Three of them with face hunter, three of them with face druid. Um, just an absolutely ridiculous run of wins. All right, and we see that that was the second chance with the Paladin for Tubia, so all he has left is the Handlock now to try and beat this aggro druid. And uh, I mean, we've talked about the Handlock versus aggro matchups. It's basically aggro out your opponent before they can play double Molten Giant. Uh, and we've seen from Sixo that he is very capable of aggroing an <laughs> opponent before turn five or six. He's more than yep. capable of rising to that challenge of outrunning his opponent. All right, this is the first time in seven straight aggro games where I would describe as Sixo's opening hand as average or below. Every yeah. face hunter game, he was hitting Worgen Infiltrator plus buffs. Every face druid so far, he's had a curve involving Garnus' Aspirin. Oh yeah, he's just drawn like a god yes. all day. <laughs> this is the first one where he actually has to try and get some work done with uh, less than optimal draws. So um, we'll see if he can engineer his way through here. Uh, more coil off the top for two beers. All right, the draws might just be starting to swing around here because that was a very, very nice top deck for more, for, for two beers to pick up there with the mortal coil. Hero power on turn two for six. All right, yeah, he, there's the emo. Natural mistake. I didn't hit my aspirin in this game. Obvious misplay from six o to not draw aspirin for turn two. Well, let's let's life tap and help my opponent kill me. I mean, this is the thing, right? This is the, the counterintuitive thing with with Handlock against Face Hunter traditionally is that you're really helping your opponent's hero power. But if, you could, if Sixo mm. can put down something like a Savage Combatant, the exact is the exact same is also true. Yeah, honestly, this is like one of the first things you learn when you, you start playing Handlock, you know, when you're newer to the game, is that not to fear the life tap. Don't worry about the damage you're doing to yourself. Even against Hag aggro, you need the options. But when your opponent has been so relentlessly beating you down so quickly, you can't help but slip back into that fearful mode where you're just a little bit concerned about even life tapping when you're all the way up at 27 lives. So. Just terrifying amount of uh, aggression in the last few games from 6-0. But like we said, a little bit of a slower start this game. But you know, let's 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 not oversell it. He's had a decent hand. He's had a he had a Lepanome on turn one. He had a three drop. He had a really strong four drop. But this is a pretty good draw from the handlock as well. Yeah, we'll see some board control here. Let's do it finally. Yep. Um, there is a big game down. hunter to answer yeah. the fell Reaver. He does have the answer. Uh, he doesn't have anything he would want to play alongside the big game hunter. I wouldn't like to see him just play out additional cards for no reason, just to just to burn extra cards, which is something some players are tempted to do when they see a fell Reaver. Oh, but God, yeah, two beers not falling into the trap, into the trap, just life tapping, stabilizing. Big game hunter on the eight eight, and now he's well ahead in this game. Yeah, I mean, this is the the other side of the aggro druid is that sometimes you just get completely burnt out by your opponent. Your opponent takes the board, and you can't get anything going. Yeah, Living roots is nice for dealing with big game hunter, at least reducing some of the tempo loss. And six zero, it looks like he's accepting that he can't just activate the race with his current hand. He needs to try and play in more of a regular druid style, develop a board, and then uh, potentially just just clutch out it in more of a classic style against the handlock and try and perhaps use the uh, full combo later on but yeah all right not gonna waste any time defender of argus on ancient watcher and doom guard comes down and 6-0 is just gonna peace out and uh, try and pick up his one extra win elsewhere all right so one down for the aggro druid if you're six -0, is there a part of you that just thinks Do you know what let's just go straight back in with the aggro druid because it worked well for three games yeah, but by the, by the same argument, the face hunter worked pretty well for three games before, right? And oh, wow, obviously, 6-0 likes this patron build against Handlock. Yeah, we saw him pick up a win against Handlock uh, earlier. I think it was against 
the against Gara, perhaps was it? It may well have been, yeah. But um, it makes a lot of sense because you you have cards like Pilot Shredder in your deck instead of some of the combo pieces, and being able to proactively play a Pilot Shredder is a lot scarier to a handlock than just sitting around hoarding cards and letting them have free time to to tap and develop whatever they want. So, it makes a lot of sense that he'd favour this matchup more with the new style of mid rangey patron deck than he did with the previous combo focused version. Um, but yeah, likes it enough to just uh, pick it out here. Um, and just try and pick up the win. So, yeah. So, what's going on for the hand log here? Is the option to just dark bomb this? Yeah, unstable Gorn on turn two is actually pretty scary against Patron Warrior because you don't want them to develop an acolyte behind it. But you do always have the option of just dark bombing the acolyte next turn if you really want to. Um, so, I don't mind seeing the tap come out here. Um, what you just don't want to do is just don't play a minion that you can then pop his unstable ghoul on and activate his acolyte value. Because um, now he does still have the option to dart bomb the acolyte if he wants to, because he doesn't actually have a four drop to play. But all right. Oh, there you go. There's one. Never mind. There it is. Twilight Drake pick up. I don't think there's any silence in this deck. Uh, Not sure if I've seen any. No, uh, in the in the game we saw him win against Hamlock previously. He actually used both of his executes early against two Twilight Drakes and was actually able just to push through the late game taunts using the higher value minions in the deck, the Doctor Boom, the Gromash, etc. Um, normally, if you're the um, the patron player and you're forced to use both your executes early against a Hamlock with the the previous style of the deck, you kind of lost the game immediately when the late game yeah. board, taunt board came down, unless you have that god emperor hand with both Grim Patron and Frothing Berserker in it. So. I like this play with the Frothing Berserker. Unfortunately, it is going to be directly answered with the Dark Bomb, but I do like it from 6 So developing a big Frothing Berserker. I mean, that is the role of Frothing Berserkers in this new deck, right? It's just at a point, build up like a 6 or 7 attack Frothing Berserker. I just say, all right, answer this. Yeah, it's basically just putting something on the board very, very cheaply. It's a cheap investment in terms of, you know, a tempo investment just to play a three mana card. And you can create situations where your opponent has to deal with it or die. And you'd be basically using that to mess up key turns from your opponent. So against a handlock, any turn you can make them spend mana on removal and not just drop another huge threat on the board when you're not ready for it. You have to consider that a win. The Dread Corsair coming down is a card that Six was very attached to, kept it in his patron build for a long time uh, pre nerf. Gets another one off the Battle Rage as well. Thorison coming down here on a, a reasonable hand for the handlock. Getting those Mortal Coils to zero is pretty nice. The Taunt at one mana is also very good. So, not hitting things like Giants and Twilight Drakes or anything huge like Malganus, but some decent value coming into the hand. I mean, at the end of the day, you're reducing seven cards, so it's always going to feel pretty good. Sure. Um, he has the option for a big uh, Inner Rage tempo play this turn if he wants to. He can coin out the Doctor Boom and then use Inner Rage on his Acolyte to trade with the um, Emperor Thorasan using his uh, Fiery War Axe as well. Retain the, the stronger minion. Oh, he's actually just going to trade directly and hold on to his weapon. That's interesting. Valuing the weapon charge over the minion on the board is, is pretty interesting there. Yeah, I mean, Sixo knows what he's doing with this deck. He I'm sure, a lot. absolutely <laughs> sure he does, yeah. Yeah, this is, the, this is the thing we were saying the other day, is that it's the, you know there's a reason that people aren't playing with this because it's not really tested yet, but Sixo has tested it extensively on ladder. He's played it to, to, to high legend mm -hmm. against all the other current strong decks, and he knows how to play it, and it, it says a lot to his versatility that he goes from being one of the best original patron players in the game to being one of the best to being probably the best right now at this new mid-range patron before most people have even bothered to pick it up yet sure um all right slam is a is an option to cycle but this feels like a matchup that Sixo's is trying to play as the aggressor here he doesn't want to really be doing the old-fashioned patron thing of just cycling and hoarding cards he wants to be developing threats um, so the maximum threat he can develop this turn is the uh, lower Theb and Dread Corsair. And of course, we're idiots. It's really, like, it's just so goddamn obvious why he was valuing the weapon over the minion on board. He had another Dread Corsair in his hand. <laughs> I don't know why I missed that last turn, but yeah, all right. I'll just blame it on fatigue at this point, I guess. <laughs> well, the fatigue warrior has gone, thankfully. So yeah, no, that's very No accurate. actual fatigue in that sense. Molten Giant is live this turn with the Sun Fury Protector. Can definitely get some value. Uh, possibly want to deal with this low theb though. You're getting pretty low on life. You are. Um, you seen one execute come out from your mm -hmm. opponent, and you've had a threat stick stick to the board here that may have brought out a second execute. So I don't know how confident you feel um, about just hiding behind a taunt wall. Um, but this... 
options aren't fantastic. He can put up two big taunts, but there is a lot of power on the board to then deal with those taunts. Obviously, his removal options like Hellfire are locked out by the lower third effect. So it's like he's just going to go ahead and develop Dr. Shield Boom here and then taunt up the 7-7 seven, seven and a Boom Bot. Yep, so creates that big taunt with the Dr. Boom. But Slam is going to cycle now. Six is looking for a, a Brawl or an Execute. Isn't going to find it. Yeah, Whirlwind would have been a pretty nice pickup there as well, because he still has the mana for the patron in a rage Whirlwind. That you know, it might be worth the risk of not have, not running into a Hellfire because it does actually help to deal with the um, the Boombots on board as well. And he's in fact actually going to go for the patron generation anyway. Hope to get lucky off the Boombots to try and get some sort of foothold on the board here. No, oh, no, never mind. He's just going to concede. It's a pretty early concede from Sixo there, but uh, it's not uncommon for him to also do that as well when he feels like he's even just a little bit behind is that he doesn't really see a, a way back over the next few turns that he's just going to get out of that game and try again well three to two now for six so and two beers looking like he's trying to stage a comeback here uh so it's going to be the warlock of two beers the handlock and it's against the face hunter of six so all right back to the smark and he tried, tried to play with the patron. Back to the opening hand, Worgen Infiltrator, Glaive Zuka. Like, he has hit this so very, very consistently in his Face Hunter game so far. Um, it's just one of the best possible openings you can ever, ever get. Um, from 2 Beers side, I'd like to see him hang on to the Void Caller. It's uh, just your, your best chance at a big tempo swing against this deck. Emperor Thoris on a little bit clunky, but if you're able to stabilize enough in the early game turns, it can do some nice things. And uh, a card that we've seen that's quite interesting that he has teched into his deck is a little bit different from the standard list. He's playing a Siphon Soul, which has mm. kind of been forced out of Handlock for, for quite a few months now, but there are still a few players who favor it. Yeah, particularly with the demons coming in, it's uh, many people don't find a spot for it anymore. Right, it's already a deck that you there aren't enough spots on for the amount of cards that you want to play. You're already cutting things you know, as good as Sludge Belcher from the deck to make room for things. So yeah. interesting that he's finding room for a uh, Siphon Soul. Yeah, there are some people who can't even find more than room for more than one hellfire and one shadow flame for example it's a very very bur a fill to bursting deck that's really hard to to fit all the cards you want into um if you want to tech stuff out yeah i, I really like this play to develop the the two three here because otherwise if, if we saw um like zuka on that organ infiltrator it was going to get in for six before you had any way of interacting with it and that's just so much damage to take early unfortunately um Sixo had both options covered. He had the really, really aggressive play with the Glaive Zuka, but he also had the way to beat the 2-3 with the Eagle Hornbow. He also has the Arcane Golem for three, which uh, nah. is definitely an option. He's going to play the Mad Scientist. I actually don't mind it, though, because your opponent is going to be on turn four anyway, so turn four is a, you know, it's a good turn for Handlock with things like Twilight Drake and the Void Caller. But if your opponent's going to be on four anyway, the Mountain Giant's going to be on six because they played the Sun Fury. It's actually not a particularly you know, be, uh, beneficial turn to give the opponent uh, an extra mana crystal. Right, you have to consider that you're not only giving them an extra mana crystal for that one turn, though. And doing it so early sure. in the game is such a huge advantage to give them over the entire course of the game. If he didn't have any other two drops to play on this turn four, then I think you 100% would have taken the risk with the Arcane Golem, because you need to two drop, you need to play a two mana card plus hero power on turn four, looking at this hand. But because he had that option available to him already with the Glaive Zuka, there was no need to make the investment. They're just really really risky nice investment with the arcane that just goes with the one ton a little bit of desperation here from two beers yeah um so but it is going to force out the jaraxus onto the board and he does have the second sun fury to then back that up and yeah i i like him trading with the mad scientist here because from what he can see that forces both minions to trade whereas if he kills the three one worgen infiltrator the rest uh, of the trade can be done using the hunter's face and then the other minion retained on board to do repetitive damage um, so I actually think his his little yeah you you saw his his thought process there by where he was pointing his arrow he started off on the wall and then he just realised that maybe the mad scientist was better um, I think he would have ended up in the right place to be the stop there. Yeah. So is there any lethal here for six? So he's going to count the damage. He has what six, eight, nine damage. Is he just going to go all in here with the arcane and the glaive zuka? I think having seen the Jaraxxus come out, he's trying to just invest as much melee damage as he can right now um, so that he doesn't have to beat this taunted Jaraxxus if it does get taunted up. He can just try and rely on the hero power to do its job um, alongside the kill command. So he needs more than just taunt this turn, but he does now have more than taunt. He has lower than taunt. Yep, that is available. 
And that's going to lock down this board, but Hero Powering Kill Command will be enough to seal this out. There's no heal mm. if he doesn't use the Siphon Soul. Yeah, I mean, this, this he, is just game, right? No, because Lower Theb. Okay, because Lower, yeah, Theb, lower Theb, Theb locks out the Kill Command. Yeah, like I said, he needs something extra apart from the Taunt. He did draw the Lower Theb there, which is enough to do the job. And like, Kill Command just becomes straight up uncastable at this point. And so the taunt... It gives him one turn, but... Unless he draws into heal. Well, he has a, he has a heal. He has a Siphon Soul. So Is that going to be enough? No, it's not enough from his perspective. Uh, sorry, it's not enough from our perspective because we see the kill command. But it does, from Two Beer's perspective, allow him to keep pace with the hero power. So he's demanding at least you know damage sources from his opponent that can that beat these taunts. All right. Does have Hellfire in hand as well to defend against uh, another board flood. But he's very low on life for that to be considered an option, mousing over that. Right. Um, so yeah, realistically, you know, he might hold out some outside hopes that this Siphon Soul in his hand is enough. Um, but realistically, we're going to have to see an Antique Heal bot top deck this turn. Yeah, because it's just going to be a potential Explosive Trap. There's going to be the Kill Command and the Hero Power next turn. So it's going to be 5 damage, potentially 7 with the... If he does trigger the Explosive Trap, which I wouldn't imagine he will. So yeah, this is just going to be a siphon soul. And Mortal Coil, can we use that this turn? I don't think we can. I think that's just game. He's going to siphon, siphon soul. soul because it's the best he can do, but it's not going to be good enough. Siphon Soul is going to take him to, to 6 or being exact lethal, right? I yep. Um, it's not like he can siphon soul gain the life and then tap to try and look for some sort of long-term answer because it just doesn't gain him enough life to be able to afford that sort of leeway. So the Siphon Soul is going to come down here because it is going to be his best option, his only option to get out of this. Uh, he's just considering his various options with the traps, but so uh, it's, it's, it's been a great run, but it looks like it's coming to an end here. Yeah, unfortunately, it looks like Sixo is going to clear, is going to beat two. Oh, right. apologies for that momentary loss of commentary there, but the, uh, the result was a foregone conclusion, a 4-2 victory for 6 So with the Face Hunter. We're going to go to a very short break, and when we come back, going to be a winner's interview. All right, I'm here with our winner. It's not subtle. It is, in fact, Sixo. Uh, a commanding performance all the way through this tournament. We're going to talk about a couple of the, the, couple of the key points as well, but first question I've got to ask you, did you have somewhere to be today? Because... Uh, it was you were just god drawing aggro all day long. Yeah, I had one bad druid game to actually lost in the against the handlock when I had to pass turn two. But other than that, I had a lot of Danos aspirants on turn one and turn two, so can't complain. And then against Soleil, I think you drew Worgen Infiltrator every game. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I mean, I know you. You know, obviously, you're a very strong patron player. You're very strong in the freeze mage, and with this new patron as well that I want to touch on in a second. Uh, but you are very much a strong aggro player, and, and you really showed that today. Yeah, I mean, I played quite some priest on ladder the past days, but I figured that the aggro decks are just the best right now, so I st just took them. Let's talk about the new mid-range patron because you were one of the few players to bring it. You're probably one of the few players who has really got to grips with the deck at this point. Some people haven't even had the time or, or bothered to pick it up yet. But you showed uh, in the earlier matches that you were able to get a couple of wins with it. And it is a really strong deck. Do you think it can be competitive at the top level? Yeah, in this tournament it went before the finals 8-1. So it was the finals 8-2 for me. But more than half the time it got banned. So I didn't get to play it much. But it did get two all kills. Do you think it can really be a top tournament deck, you know, more consistently? I think that the deck might have to make some adjustments. I'm not sure if like, the list I play, I'm playing right now is the way to go, but 
if the list is figured out, the best list, I'm pretty sure it will still be competitive. I mean, in that semi-final against LA, that was one of the fastest competitive series I think we've seen in just about any tournament with the face hunter. It did show, I guess, one of the disadvantages of last year's standing, but uh, how did it feel getting such a quick and dominant win there? Well, I knew that it's only a deck that can really beat my face hunter was the Stuart, and when this turn two was hero power pass, I basically knew I had it. Absolutely. So, just final thoughts. Obviously, on the final against Two Beers, the player you kind of know you you've played you're from the same place. You played in fireside gatherings against each other. Did it feel bad to just just to stomp a, a newcomer, a bright eyed and bushy tailed up and comer? Well, he got second place. He can't complain. <laughs> <laughs> all right six is there anyone you want to thank anyone you want to shout out sponsors team that sort of thing i thank my team and oskaka since he helped me with the decks so thanks navi and thanks oskaka well six so uh thank you for taking part in the tournament congratulate you once again on your victory we want to thank our sponsors g2a esport gaming match arena our french broadcast partners o gaming our production partners curixel esports studio salt and fireback who joined me on the cast i want to thank our admin martin as well who put in a heroic effort over the past three days doing the work of a, a whole army of people and of course casper who put all of this together we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him thank you to all of them thank you to all of you who watched as well we will see you back for another hs arena tournament in the future make sure you follow at official hs arena on twitter for all the details of that when it comes. I've been Callum Leslie. It's been a pleasure to host this event for the past three days. We'll see you another time.